1 Corinthians chapter 11. This will be entitled, uh, Bylaws for the Body of Christ. And you can tell by the title what I've been doing. <laughs> Bylaws are tedious and a disaster to try to understand. To make things legal according to the law, you have to have all these rules and regulations and all this and that. And they want to see it in a, in a document, the bylaws. Well, the body of Christ is no different. In the Bible, there are bylaws for the body of Christ. Jesus simplifies it and just uses one word to describe the bylaws. It's called bread. And we'll look at it. Uh, as you go through bylaws, man can't quite uh, make them all inclusive like God can. He can't, he can't figure out how to avoid all situations that might pop up. Now, God can, but man can't. Here's some bylaws. Uh, this is church bylaws, and you never get it all. Here's one of them. No one can bring colored drinks into the church, especially Kool-Aid. Well, I would agree with that, but there's probably, you know, grapefruit juice and grape juice and other things. So now they've missed a few. No Kool-Aid, but what about the other ones? No one can sell cassettes on the church grounds. Okay, that's good, but what about CDs and MP3s and records? And Okay, they missed a few. Uh, no one is allowed to bring glitter to church. Well, I'd agree with that one. But I also wouldn't want them bringing bubble gum either. The girls have a horror story they tell about bubble gum. Uh, no church member can drink alcohol except during the Lord's Supper. Well, you definitely shouldn't be drinking it then either. <laughs> Here's a good one. No one can come to church with diarrhea. Well, I'd say that that's a pretty good rule, and we might ought to add that one. <laughs> <laughs> it says, no member can have assigned pews, but you're welcome to bring your own personal chair. <laughs> That's how crazy it gets. God's bylaws are real simple, and they're all inclusive, and they tell you exactly what you need to know. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. It says, for I have received of the Lord that which also... I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. There's all these terms that are used. Organizational documents, operational documents, articles of incorporation. When you go to get your... Um, okay from the government to say I've got everything that I need to be a legal organization. They want to see all of that stuff. Okay, for God it's simple. My body is supposed to be bread. Now that's pretty, pretty plain. So what's the purpose of bread? The purpose of bread of course is the health of the body. That's why you eat bread. That's what you need bread for. Now, of course, the bread he's talking about is not the kind of bread we have, leavened bread, because Christ is our Passover. So the Passover bread is unleavened bread. Okay, the reason for bread is it's to make the body healthy. But that's not to do with eating bread for satisfying the flesh. Because in this same passage at verse 34, he says, If any man hunger, let him eat at home. So if you're supposed to be bread, it's not to do with something that we get off of a table. It's a spiritual bread. This bread is going to be a sign of the past, a representation of the present, and a seal of the future. And we'll see that in this chapter. Chapter 11, verse 26. He says, For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death, past, till he come, future. Flip back a chapter, chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 16, said, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Past tense, blood. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Present tense, us. For we being many are one body, present. For we are all partakers of that one bread, past tense, something you already took, partook of. In John chapter 6, he tells us, Jesus talking about himself, 
I wasn't going to make you turn there, but okay, you can. It's John 6, 51. He says, Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. So he is the bread. So we need to learn about bread. We need to look at Jesus Christ. Health for the body is important. So we need all of Jesus Christ we can get. That's where the bread is. However, health for the body is intended for more than just selfishness. If all I do is go to the Bible for self, I've become selfish. Now, I might have bettered myself, but the world does that. That's not what it's about. It's about something more. It's intended for way more than selfishness. It's intended for the helpfulness of that body. The body should become helpful. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, Once the body's help healthy, then it can help someone else. A malnutritioned Ethiopian probably is not going to help you carry your load of whatever you're carrying. <laughs> you need a healthy man to do that. Romans 10, verse 14, he says, How then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? Or how shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay, once you're healthy, you should do something for somebody else. So the body of Christ is the bread here. You get it, but don't just eat it and enjoy it. Take it to somebody else. Do something with it. In Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Acts chapter 19, verse 2. This is Paul coming into town. He's coming into Corinth. And he's got a group of people here. And he asks them a question. He says, uh, verse 2. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Okay, so now he's going to teach them. Okay, once you get healthy, go teach somebody. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you forsake them because they don't know something. No, you teach them. <laughs> Not everybody's going to know everything. You didn't know what you know now. At some point, you had to learn it. <laughs> okay, so be, be free with teaching somebody. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, you find a special blessing attached to somebody who will do this. If you'll be a part of the body that will help somebody else, God gives you a special benefit. 2 Timothy 4, verse 17. He says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Well, that'd be a good deal. Get some strength. We need that. That by me the preaching might be fully known and that all Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Okay, God intends you to be his mouthpiece. And if you will do it, he'll give some deliverance from the lion. That's what he's talking about right here. Okay, so you'll get special deliverance from things you don't think you'll be delivered from. God's more powerful than your circumstances. Open your mouth. In Titus chapter 1, verse 3, Titus chapter 1, verse 3. He says, But hath in due times manifest his word. Okay, the word of God is going to be manifest in a specific fashion. This is how God has chosen to make his word become apparent through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. It's a commandment. Everybody should be preaching. He said, that's how my word is going to be made plain to people. It's going to be made manifest. Bylaws do state the mission of an organization. However, they're more about avoiding problems than telling you what they're going to do. This holds true with the bylaws for the body of Christ as well. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What did the bag of flour say to the, the bread of lo uh, a loaf of bread? I saw you yesterday. 
Okay. Well, that's a typical problem with bread. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Dangerous doctrines is going to be the first thing we see. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Okay, so leaven has to be something that you get rid of. And if you had known it all along, he wouldn't be telling you. Okay, so it's going to creep in. you got to watch it. Dangerous doctrines. Leaven in the Bible refers to several things, but I'll show you a few of them. In Matthew, he begins by saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Okay, so we understand whatever the Pharisees are doing, God considers that leaven, and we've got to beware of it. Uh, in Mark, you see the Pharisees and the Herodians get together. So now we've got Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. One's a religious group, or two's a religious group, and one's a political group. They all get together, and there's something they have in common. What it is is they want to catch his words. It's not that they're trying to stay away from the Word of God. No, they want to use it. They want to hear what he says and twist it. That is leaven. He says we've got to stay away from that. In Matthew twenty-two fifteen, he says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel, how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, okay, here's what they're going to ask him, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Here's leaven. Here's a, a definition of leaven we don't think of often. It's going to the word of God with a preconceived notion of what you want it to say to benefit you. They didn't want to pay taxes. So they said, let's see if we can find a way to make Jesus tell us we don't have to pay taxes. That's leaven. Stay away from leaven. Go to the Bible and let it tell you what to do. You don't tell it what to do. The Sunday school teacher was um, telling her class, okay, class, do you know what's in the Bible? The little boy said, oh, I know what's in the Bible. She said, oh, you do? Good. Tell me what's in the Bible. He said, well, it's got a recipe from Aunt Sally. It's got the phone bill in it. You know, it's got my first grade picture in it. <laughs> That's the way we are sometimes. We, we think what's important about the Bible is what we put in it. Mm -mm. It's what it puts in us. In uh, Luke, 1, uh, Luke 12, verse 1, he says, beware, be, uh, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, and then he defines it, which is hypocrisy. So hypocrisy is saying one thing and doing another. Uh, we understand that clearly. So that's something a Christian's got to be aware of. Paul is saying, get rid of the leaven. It happens even amongst Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Corinthians 5, 8. He says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. That's the Pharisees and Sadducees. Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the, lev uh, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So right doctrine and right actions are what are intended for good doctrine. However, those still have to be accompanied by a right attitude. Just having the right actions isn't enough. If the attitude's not right, it's still wrong, according to God. Dangerous disposition. That's the next thing. So we've seen a dangerous doctrine, and now we'll see a dangerous disposition. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. When does bread rise? When you yeast expect it. <laughs> First Corinthians. <laughs> I got Rachel excited. <laughs> First Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. 
So he's talking to Christians here. He says, I look, I know y'all are going out here just beating everybody up because some people are eating things offered to idols and some aren't. He said, okay, great, you've got some knowledge, but knowledge needs to be accompanied with the right attitude or else nobody's going to listen to your argument. Your attitude's got to be right in order for the knowledge to be beneficial. The attitude's important. Chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18. He says, for first of all, when you come together in the church. Okay, so that is corporate church right there. There's a whole group of people who are anti-church establishment. Okay, how are they coming together in the church? They view the church as the body of Christ, which it is, but they don't view it as a group. Well, if the body of Christ is coming together, then that must be they've all died and gone to heaven. <laughs> okay, it's talking about a local group coming together. When you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you. What a thing to say. That they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Paul says it's necessary to have some people be way off. <laughs> it is. When you teach a young kid arithmetic, you want him to do the math. Okay, two plus two is what? Four, okay. Two plus three is what? Five, okay. Three plus three is what? Twenty-five. No, no, that was not right. Okay, you don't get rid of him because he got the answer wrong. You teach him. But it's approved... You, you've proved who you are, that you've got the right answer, and it's shown that he doesn't. It's important. Now you can teach him what the right answer is, how to get it, how to do the math. We don't say, oh, no, you got the wrong answer. Don't talk to me again. <laughs> we say, no, let me show you how to fix that. You're getting the wrong answer. Let me show you how to come up with the right math. That's what Paul's talking about here. He says it's necessary for people to... Sh say what they're thinking and if they're thinking wrong somebody needs to be able to open the bible and show them that's not the full counsel on that subject let me show it to you here's what it really means according to the bible that's what the, that's what's going to happen now if you don't ever come together in a group how are you going to get that solved you're not you need other people to say hey yeah i used to think that too let me show you why I've decided that wasn't right. We're all going to have differences of opinions and ideas. And Paul says, heresies are okay. But if the attitude is right, we can fix them. We can fix it. Unlike man-made laws, bylaws, by God gives a positive prescription for problem prevention. He does. Now, for us to do problem prevention, it's going to be negative. Don't you dare do <laughs> God gives us a positive one in the bylaws. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. I call this bunching, lunching, and laughing. <laughs> bunching, lunching, and laughing. How, could you imagine a thing? God says, I've got to get a group of people that are totally different from everything else in this world. I'm going to get them together, and here's the commandment I'm going to give them. Have a good time. Can you imagine having to command that? That's what he does. Acts 2, verse 46. Acts 2, 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. When Christians get together, they should have joy. It should be enjoyable. It shouldn't be something you dread. That's a body. A body should be working together, right actions, right attitude, and enjoying being there, each other. Meeting, eating, and enjoying. But the world does that too, don't they? They've been doing that since time began. A Christian has a bonding element that holds us together. The world does not. We have truth. 
We do. Captivated by the truth. They should be captivated by truth. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. It says, And upon the first day of the week, I guess I'll let you get there. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Wow. Imagine the keys rattling over that one. <laughs> it says, they got together and they were enjoying it. Paul had to go somewhere the next morning. But it didn't matter. They were having such a good time being together. They kept on until midnight. Now, how many of us, when we got to make a trip the next morning, would want to go to church? If it's going to be somebody long-winded like me. <laughs> but look at Paul's really long-winded. He preaches till midnight. But he said there was something in there that captivated them. It held them captive. They were enthralled with the idea of learning about what God had to say. In Acts 20, verse 11. When he therefore was come up again, he had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while till break of day. So he departed. This is just typical. When the early church got together, they were excited to be there. They knew they were going to have to bring lunch because Paul's a long-winded preacher. <laughs> so they're always talking about breaking bread. But they're enjoying being there. And obviously it captured their attention, else they would have left. Paul himself says, I'm not an orator. My speech is rude. But in knowledge, I'm not rude. So he knew what he was talking about. And the truth itself captivated their interest, not entertainment. There's something missing in our churches today. Not only that, we're now deputized to proselytize. That's, your, that's the church. Your job is to go proselytize. Um, the word preach in the Bible is used 144 times. Preach, preaching, any derivative of preach. God intends a man to see this instruction is necessary. Or, or he would not have used it so many times. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49... Ezekiel 16, 49. So you've come to church, that's good. You've gotten some Bible, maybe some instruction, learned something, maybe relearned something you already knew, that's good. But now you've got to go get rid of it. You've got to go tell somebody. Or else you've not functioned like God intends the body to function. Look at somebody who does not function the way they should. Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread. She got a lot of bread. And abundance of idleness. She didn't put out the bread. You got some bread? Good. Now do something with it. Put it out. Don't sit, soak, and sour. Ponder, participate, and preach. That's what God intends us to do. In conclusion, God's designed the body of Christ to function like your human body. Each member has a unique and vital role to make the whole work together. And we'll learn some more about that tonight. But each person here, God's given a job to. And if you don't do your job, the body can't function correctly. Now, we can compensate for it. You know, if you you got a, a, a leg that's too short or something, you just limp and you figure out how to get by on it. You can compensate. However, it's not functioning the way it should. So each of us have to find out what God intends us to do and do it 100%, or the unit doesn't work right. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 17... 1 Corinthians 12, verse 17. He says, If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where's the smelling? Okay, so we know, Paul says, your body, you can look in the mirror and understand the way God has set up his body. 
you don't have a face full of eyes. <laughs> you have different parts on your face, and they all function independently and do something totally different, but they're all necessary to the face. In verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of the body, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. He's got many members, but one body, one body of Christ. Okay, we've got to function correctly if we don't. Can you imagine being the one responsible for the body of Christ, not moving where it should have? We get to heaven. He says, look, I really wanted to go to Africa, but my legs wouldn't move. You were my legs. Ouch. I wouldn't want to hear that. We're the body of Christ. We're his body. We better function the way he intends us to function, or we'll get there and we'll be held accountable to it. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. It says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Adrian Rogers says it this way. He says, every body is somebody in his body. <laughs> you might not have a big prominent role, but you have an important role. Stub your toe and find out how important that little pinky toe is. You know, it's real important. Everybody has a purpose and a mission. The question is, do you know what yours is? I don't know what yours is. You may not know. Find out. Ask God. Tell, ask him to tell you what it is, and he will. All right, that's the bylaws for the body of Christ. God simplifies it by just calling it bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that uh, we would uh, function the way you intend us to and that we would find out uh, direction from you and uh, what we're supposed to do and how we should do it, that we'd uh, take the right actions, but then we'd have the right attitude in doing it. In your name we pray, amen.